Okay. And Tony was in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> From my perspective, what year did you start? 60, 61, 62, 63, 61, but I, I started working with Hamica and, uh, and he went to Penn and uh, I uh, decided not to go to Penn because I just bought a boat in the Chesapeake Bay with Ray Renard so, and, and John Wagner over in Chemical Engineering, so we um, we, we decided to stay, so I wound up with uh, Bob Parr. And then I guess uh, I looked at one uh, one couple differential equation too many. That's two. And what? And, uh, well, there were more than two. And, uh, you know, I, I decided to quit right there and I went to work with Dick. And you finished and in 60, 65. Well, that's actually the year that I started working with him at the end of the year. Yeah, but you were undergraduate there, right? That, I was undergraduate. And then Tony came and was... And 66. Yeah. I was sort of the first in a different sense, and I was the first to do the infrared work. I tell you, though, I tell you what I did first, though. I got that mass spectrometer working for you guys. <laughs> Great. Do you remember that mass spectrometer? Yes, yeah, I find, I find it very useful. Do you, do you know where it is? No. I have it in my laboratory right you do? now. Yeah. The funny part about that is, you know, we couldn't get it working, and uh, I remember Dick coming down, and we, he crept back in on a Saturday afternoon, and he um, said, don't tell my wife where I am, because I'm supposed to be somewhere else but I gotta get this thing fixed. So we worked on this mass spectrometer all weekend and uh, we had some ideas where the problem was, but we really couldn't, couldn't, get, it, couldn't get it going. And uh, you know who fixed that mass spectrometer? Dory, when he first came in. <laughs> he took one look at that thing, did this with one of those boards and found that there was a contact broken. And from then on, I guess the thing worked fine. See, I did my work with that. You did your work. I did too. Yeah. You I, did your work. You did. Yeah. Well, the isotope tracer yeah. stuff with the uh, was done on that. Well, we did some, I guess, the hydrogen the exchange. Yeah, okay. and the, we didn't work on a catalytic problem at all when I was there. We just played with that um, Elmer flask and the hot filament. And Bob Inas did that. Uh, right. So. Bob came and overlapped you, I guess. Uh, when, when did he come? 63? 64? 63, he must have been. No. Bob, yeah. Bob came towards the end and I showed him how to, how to run the, the vacuum system and how to do a little glass blowing. Bob being? Bob Ennis. Bob Ennis. Ennis. Robert Ennis. Bob Ennis. Well, I guess I have, to thank, I have you to thank for teaching Bob. <laughs> Glass blowing, because Bob taught me. Is that right? Glass blowing. I mean, my first day on the on a job, Dick said, "Here's a vacuum system. Yeah, but, you ought to learn how to use it." Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Dick did some work for me with a vacuum system, but he uh, he blew a couple of pieces of glass together, and then I started leaning on him, and I guess he got pissed off and said, um, uh, he came and he gave me five pounds of glass and locked the door. He says, "Now you don't leave here until you learn how to do this stuff." <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that was <laughs> that was the yeah, that was the that was the end of that, and uh, I figured I you know I by 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 in about a week I was making a cloud gauge. Uh -huh. He used to come and, and do the as much glass one as he could get away with in the laboratory. Yeah. But he used to like to do it. He used to love to oh, do it. And, yes. and, and, and he was good to the point to a certain point. He wasn't he had toward the end. With the meetings, he just didn't have the time to do it and wasn't in practice doing it. We, I remember finally not letting him get near my system because he'd, he'd put some lumps in there I didn't want to keep around uh, <laughs> periodically. But he, he would certainly get into the lab and try to do things on the, on the, on the equipment regularly. I mean, do them, not try to do them, do them regularly. Uh, well, I didn't do everything except ring seals. I had difficulty. With ring seals, like I learned now to pass those off to professional glass blowers. <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. do everything else. I had the uh, 
I also had the undergraduate laboratory, the freshman lab. And if you remember the, the uh, experiment, we had determined the uh, molecular weight of gases. And, and I remember going in and having that set that system up. And unfortunately, they were using silicone stopcock grease, which sort of trickled down into the capillary glassware. Everywhere that there was a break and there was silicone stopcock grease, you had a real problem because you ended up with soft glass. You pyrolyzed the glass. Pyrolyzed the glass. And I finally had developed a rule if you broke it, you were gone for the day. <laughs> but the kids learned not, not, not to break the glass. And they, yeah, that. Uh, that was a complex. You had to you had to be pretty pretty gifted to be a TA in that lab. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had to be able to do glass blowing, and uh, it was uh, yeah. it was an experience. Did, was uh, was Dick teaching freshman chemistry when you came to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that the most interesting uh, rule that he had to ensure that that students could TA graded these these things properly was to. Uh, uh, if the students had a complaint, they had to uh, uh, come in at six o'clock in the morning on Monday to answer the complaints. Mm -hmm. So, and the TAs had to be there also. So, so both the TAs and the students had to come in at six o'clock. So, you know, I think that they, they probably stuck to their grading pretty well after that. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't make too many mistakes. <laughs> I guess he's, he taught freshman chemistry all through when I was there, so I guess that, that was... Yeah, it overlapped all of us. It overlapped all of us. Well, Ed, Ed was uh, after Tony, right? Yes, that's right. I arrived yeah. about the time Tony left. He left in June or July, and I arrived in September. Yeah, of 70. Yes, of 70. Well, when, when did you go there, Tony? In 66? 66. 66, okay. The group was really small when I was there. All that was really was Ray, Ray and, and me and... Glamazo had just finished up. He had a maximum of the three, I guess, going in. And the only thing, but then it blossomed up to about six. I guess we had about a maximum of six, didn't we, Ed? Uh, of course, a couple well, of people yeah, were just started. Well, yeah, Charlie Chang and... Uh, you and... and uh, Kurt and yeah, Louis Dixon. Louis Dixon and... Uh, Myself and Blanca. 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 Okay. Blanca. And... Uh, so... Roger Barth came on there. At yeah, the very well, that end. was yeah. the, the the very oh, and what was the other guy? Oh, Jerry Stansel. Jerry Stansel, yeah. I forgot about Jerry. Jerry came he, same after year I, I left. The same year I did. Same, same year yeah. you did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then Palazov was there, and when I was there, who uh, was with the Russian postdoc? What was his name? Um, no, Italian, Laja No, 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 no. When I was there, he showed up in '73. Oh, Kazansky. Kazansky, yeah, I remember. Kazansky was working with him. Kazansky had a problem. He couldn't go to Towson because his visa was not uh, activated for Towson. That's right. It was only about 11 oh, miles away. So he couldn't go to Dick's house. He couldn't go to Dick's house. <laughs> so we had to go down to a restaurant down in downtown Baltimore for dinner. And Kazansky wanted to have whale meat for dinner. <laughs> so we went to this restaurant. That sounds like houses to me. Houses you order, didn't get it. it we, ordered, we ordered this whale meat, and I don't think anybody could get it down. <laughs> I remember this story. The question was, do Americans eat whale meat? Or do they like whale meat? So this guy, but they did have, they specifically had, that's one of the restaurants where they had whale meat. That's, that must have been houses. Yeah. Because they, they, up until oh, that time, had Boy, it was just, you know. It I remember how this was with a five-bedroom. It, 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 it tasted like green sea catfish. catfish. Uh, yeah, is that right? Awful stuff. <laughs> I I remember about the time I got the, I got there shortly after Frank Stone had left, and Frank apparently had some liquor in his office. And rather than taking it back to uh, England with him, he uh, he gave it to Dick. And we used to have group meetings, and this seemed like an appropriate time to. Uh, get rid of the surplus uh, material that had been left behind. Anyway, we, we referred to these as the Frank Stone Memorial Bottles. Well, 
kept Frank, on being replenished. Frank, 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 Frank Stone showed up one day, okay, and uh, he he objected to them being called memorial bottles. <laughs> uh, but uh, you see, the, the Englishmen uh, insist on the proper use of the language. Right. But what what, it, what impressed me was he opened a suitcase and he pulled out this this liter of scotch or whatever the volume was, okay, and and inscribed it, you know, with, with, with the compliments of the donor and signed it. And, uh, <laughs> left this bottle behind. Did he go fishing with the group when, when you were? Oh, we went fishing one time. I, know, well, no, yeah. well, I went several times with him. I don't know when no, it started. I, uh, we had a boat, and in fact, I never took him fishing. Um, in those days, we didn't go fishing. We went crabbing. And, uh, you know, Ray and I and John Wagner used to go out, and we used to um, uh, go out Sunday morning, and we'd. Um, you used to go, go to the store and get the old chicken bags. Mm -hmm. And we'd tie the chicken bags in a piece of string and go sure. out to back bay and just throw this stuff into the water and uh, take turns with a net. You bring these things up slowly and you scoop them up. Right. And then what we do is go and watch the Colts play. And we've had the, the, the national beer, the hot peppers and the crabs. You just steam them in the, in, in the old trash can. He, we, he's, uh, Dick would organize, or we'd organize a, a group fishing expedition. I don't know who instigated that. We only did that once or twice. I did. I got pictures from about four different times, mm -hmm. but I was there for a total of nine years and worked for him for uh -huh. eight. So <laughs> we'd go down there and, and go out and get up at 4:30 or something in the morning because you had to get down there by 5:30 to leave on the boat and then go out and. Catch stripers when they were running. That was the best part of it. Of course, the food, the, the fish were good. How did you? Did you go in a charter out there? Or we charter a boat uh, just above the Bay Bridge, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and go out there and talk about science and drink oh, beer and wine. <laughs> Talked about where the fish should have been. Uh, our celebrations were across uh, North Charles Street. There in the uh, this little in the grad pub. club. No, it was before the grad club actually came into existence. There was not a little, just a pub there that would go and celebrate a victory. Mm -hmm. And if you got a new specter and an interpretation yeah, of it, it was time to go celebrate. Uh, Cocos, Cocos, <laughs> Cocos. When it, I guess he, he liked to sell. Cocos like he was the last man to close up the bar, but. Uh, I really remember when I uh, I was a little bit tight in taking oral exams, and uh, he was worried that uh, you know in in, in the department pre uh, prelim I guess uh, if, you know you tune up for your for your group oral whatever mm -hmm. it is uh, you know I knew that the uh, writer asked this question about uh, ortho and para hydrogen and the statistical so I knew all about ortho para hydrogen but. Uh, I got up there, and, he, and and the son of a gun asked me orthoparatridium, and I couldn't figure that out for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I get all tight. So he figured before the group war, what he's going to do is take me out and loosen me up. <laughs> so we, we went out, and I had about three Manhattans, and uh, I did fine after that. There was no problem. I got everything right. <laughs> that was over in the faculty club, I guess. He was right about that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I remember those too. I was overconfident with the departmentals, and they absolutely crucified me. And was was amazed when they said that I passed. Okay, but uh, the the university orals, I I did exceed well on. That was easy. The departmental orders were tough, I thought. Well, well it's not well, three they were on purpose, tough. It, it's just right. that I could never figure out what John was asking. Greider was he was he was a tiger. Yeah, the three man board and then a five man board. Yeah, yeah, the, right. Yeah. The three man yeah. board was very difficult for me, yeah. which was preliminary, and the five man board had had turned out to be easy. Robinson and uh, Yeah. And Parr and no, not Parr I had uh, a caucus and uh, Writer. I can't even remember who I had. No, you can't no. remember who you had? No. Well, I, 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 can, I, I remember, remember those what? suckers. <laughs> I can never forget that. I can remember the, remember the universities that I had. I had oh, Walker boy. from physics. Right. I had a fellow named Henry from physics. And uh, 
the, the guy who was the sanitary engineer, Jerry somebody, I can't remember what his he, he, he turned. He was a chemical engineer in Gavis. 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 Gavis was the head of chemical engineering department. When chemical engineering disappeared, he went to sanitary engineering and then was available for okay. orals and, uh, and the like. Uh, and I can't remember who the other one You had a mathematician? Yeah, you had to have a mathematician. Yeah, there was usually two physicists. I had two physicists. Three. I had two, yeah, two, from I had two physicists. Three from outside. And a chemi an old chemical engineer. Yeah, okay. And then two from the department. Mm. used to give McCarty most of his orals. Remember McCarty? One of yeah. Dean Robinson's students. Yeah. He didn't get tenure. <laughs> I remember talking to Dean at the last time. Yeah. He'd see his meeting. He come in the lab every. You see him every morning. I used to see him. We saw him almost every day if he was in town. Who? Cookies. Oh yeah, we well, used to come in the lab in the morning, but then he became department chairman, and there was a change. In that, I used to go and sit outside his office, and when someone would come out, I'd go in, and that used to work. Uh, used to work real well. I don't think you ever liked doing that. Big you department never, chairman. Well, it's common to me. I, I was teaching. Myself at the time was, it's better to give ulcers than to receive ulcers. <laughs> so that's that's essentially why he took on the uh, the, the chairman job. I don't know why you took that on. I think that I think that uh, he didn't enjoy that. No, but I think the thing of it was he saw the job needed to be done, and nobody else seemed to want to do it. I think that's more or less why he took it on. I, I, think there, far left, I think there may have been there, another, there was another candidate in the, the certain certain group within the department wasn't satisfied with the other candidate yeah, okay. and they talked to him okay. for money. And I, I don't remember who the other, other candidate was. But, uh, How long was he to provide the department chairman before he died? I'd say a year. A year? Yeah. He'd just taken yeah. it off. Right. He'd just taken it off. How did you come to work for him? How did I come to work for him? Yeah. I uh, well, as it as, as I said, I guess at the beginning of this, I was I was working with Parr, and uh, I guess if this is tape for posterity, I shouldn't say anything. Right? <laughs> Wait, you're in the court and room, and nothing can be quoted from this conference. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, we'll stick on that. <laughs> uh, I, uh, well, you know, it, it, it was more than one a couple differential equation too many. I think that there was a personality problem. And, uh, of course, I shouldn't say that because Al Anderson speaking tonight was also part of students. So. Mm -hmm. well, about the same time? Uh, we overlapped. No, in here. no we, we, did? we did. No, no, it came a year later, 66. We overlapped, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you and Anderson. You, you and Anderson. Yeah. So did he leave about the same time you did? 1970, he got his PhD, I think. Okay. Then the same time. So, okay. so we, we just missed. So I, I saw him for the first time today. Well, I saw him for I, the first time today, too. All right. I, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> even though we overlap. I, okay. often, I often wonder what would have happened to me if I'd gotten my PhD with Parr. Well, you'd probably ch be chairman of the chemistry department, or the chemical engineering department. <laughs> I, I think it's probably the most fortunate thing I ever I ever did. It ever happened to me that I, I did I did go down and, um, and and I guess the uh, I, I guess it, it, it was not catalysis because I didn't even do catalysis in my research. We just were doing fizzy sorb propylene plus hydrogen. It had nothing to do with catalysis. Uh, but I guess it was just because uh, I felt that he was a friend, you know, and I had this this, this uh, very happy one-year experience with Parr, and uh, and uh, he just seemed like a guy to work for, and, and basically that's that's why you know, I I knew him basically because I had put an awful lot. I enjoyed the teaching, and I liked the teaching the freshman chemistry. And when you do that kind of thing, and you interact with him, and he comes down, and he, what do you think of this problem? What do you think of that problem? Can you, 
think of any ideas to, you know, we used to work on this all the time, and, yeah, you know, you get to know the man, and, uh, uh, it was either, uh, uh, I guess, uh, a Cocos or, or Dean Robinson, mm -hmm. those are the two people that I had, uh, that's closest to, I guess. In the I had a, a different situation, and I went to work the BS and we worked at Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh with Keith Hall. Mm -hmm. And after two years, I told Keith that I wanted to go to grad school. And he said, oh, you, uh, you want to work with Dick Kokus. So he picked up the telephone and he called Dick and he told Dick these outrageous lies. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I, I sent in my application and, and was accepted, and uh, so I, I pretty much uh, knew who I was going to work with uh, when I went there. But uh, I went there without any graduates, without any uh, support, so I, I started Hopkins on my own money. And I only had enough money for one semester, and Dick told me that if I got a B average, uh, He'd support me even if uh, if the department didn't. But I had a whole lot of motivation going there with enough money for one semester, <laughs> and the uh, the department picked me up and gave me a fellowship right after midterms. And I had A's in all my courses after midterms. And, uh, they, they must have thought I was worth the investment at that point. I'm, I'm curious as to why Tony went to work for him. Well. I got interested in catalysis. I was really undecided. I wanted to do spectroscopy, and I wanted to do something uh, dealing with reactions. And John Tukevich came in and gave a talk on trapping methyl radicals. And after that talk, I said, "That's what I, that's what I want to do." And the, basically, the choices were Cobus and Emmett. Mm -hmm. And I talked to people who were working for the two and decided Cocos really was a better choice to do the kind of things I wanted to do. And also I was the assistant lab director for the freshman lab, which meant that I already had an interaction with Dick, which was all positive. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, that was my choice. And I was sort of I was the first in a line of Morgan State students that came to Hopkins and I guess of the six or so that came, at least three, uh, Jerry Stansel and uh, Bill Brown worked in catalysis. Yeah, uh, but, but, but Bill Brown started working in the area after I left, I think. Yeah. He was with Grider. Yes, he, he came in uh, okay. after Grider and picked things up in the area. I had the impression that he started off as an organic chemist, although I don't know who he worked with, maybe Murr. Uh, I had the, had the impression that yeah, he, he was maybe working right. in Dunning maybe Hall right. for, for three or four years. I recently got a call from him, and I'd, I'd, I'd seen Where, him at a catalyst Where is he now? I don't know. He was at Coppin State, and oh, okay. then he was looking to, be, to move somewhere else, and that's why I'd gotten a, a call from him. Mm -hmm. But it, it was... It was one of the best decisions I ever made in terms of going into catalysis well, and working. I think, I think that both so you and, 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 and Kurt had, had probably the most productive careers of any, uh, you know, during your thesis work of any, you, which published ten papers well, apiece. No, I, I, I had I didn't, uh, uh, I had about four. I had, but you had one. I had ten, Tony but two of them Charlie were, Charlie uh, was Charlie but was Charlie surpassed me in terms of, see, I, I got the equipment all set up, <laughs> and Charlie just came in and cranked out. <laughs> Char Charlie was amazing. Charlie, yeah. Charlie took his orals, and he struggled through the courses pretty much the way everybody else did, but he took his orals, and uh, then he went off and he started to work, and he must have taken his orals in February, and sometime in midsummer, he said, well, you know, he had done everything that was in his proposal, okay, that he thought he, he, thought he was about ready to, <laughs> ready to, to finish up, and yeah. uh, he, he worked on... Uh, a little longer, so he probably worked 12, 14 months after he took his orals. And in that period of time, uh, he generated enough data for eight or ten papers, 
And then he decided that he would go back home and he disappeared, all right? And nobody heard anything from Charlie, and nobody heard anything from Charlie. And three months later, Charlie came back with a wife. So uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> that, that's also when he stopped publishing papers. <laughs> but, but, but you know, when, 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 it, when I worked with, 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 with Dick, he was not, you know, he was not well equipped. I mean, this guy was poor. I mean, we, you know, we, uh, he says, well, you have to warm up this and look at the products in the GC. So I looked around the room and, and there were no GC. <laughs> so uh, I says, Dick, um, uh, where do I find the GC? What, what, what room is it in? He says, it's just, you got to make it. There's no GC here. <laughs> so he got, a, he got a piece of pencil and paper. He put four resistors down. They just started this to this. They put the bridge here. He says, "This is this, you know. Go out to the drug to the to the hardware store there and an the electrical supply store downtown, and for fifteen twenty bucks, you should be. And you've got fifteen twenty bucks out of his pocket. Just go." <laughs> so <laughs> I went downtown and I got all this crap together, <laughs> and I put a GC, and the and the son of a bitch worked. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> and uh, I think that one of the most exciting thing for you know parts of. Just to make this thing out of 15 or 20 bucks and with an old strip chart recorder and, and, and an the thing. An automobile battery. Oh, you got it. An automobile yeah. battery. No, is it? Yeah, it's an automobile no. battery. Yeah, because I recharged about it many times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 the column was just a piece of copper tubing, you know, from the top landing yeah. of ramps to the bottom landing and a little bit of, 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 of alumina. Uh, uh, nothing good. It's the stuff you get out of the stock room, and you right. know, I ended up, yeah. you know, yeah. with, you yeah. told, me, told me how to make a column. You just get the fire extinguisher and wrap the column around the fire stand, yeah. <laughs> hook it up, and that's it. Okay. And uh, you know, about a hundred bucks worth of glassware, and I guess the most expensive part was the mercury. And he, you know, he he, he prized that because you know he didn't have any money at that time. We we, we had. You, 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 but you like had, experiments. I, I, mean, I, I wanted to do infrared, you see. That's why he says, Oh, forget it. We don't have it. Tony got the first infrared. He got, well, a, he, got a, he got a machine from where did you get that? It was, no, it, it was the no, oh, was it was the Beckman? Maybe it was. No, well, yeah, well. they probably number 21, wasn't it? You had one with crystals, didn't you? Or did you use the, you use the, the one? I, the crystals? one I had to set uh, under the spectrometer was a old single beam. Unit because you had to compensate for water, or basically what you had to do is purge the thing to get the water out of it. Uh, otherwise, your spectrum was dominated by the water in the background. Mm -hmm. And we finally got it set up and got it working. And we got this broad peak stuff. Well, we finally got the 521 over in Dean yeah. Robinson's yeah. group. And so I, we then yeah, yeah, built a portable uh, so. vacuum system, mm -hmm. uh, flow system, and then we took, so we would take that over there and set it up, and we would do most of the experiments in the lab, and then go over and reproduce them, and we got it up, so we set up, and, and, and we had the uh, connections. To, to set up the whole thing in, in there, and you take your liquid nitrogen over and, and set everything up, and then you'd run for 16 hours. Because once you got on the, the instrument, you didn't want to get off, and so easily if you got on in the morning, you just run until midnight or, or even later. And, and uh, there we got good quality spectra that were well resolved, and we were able to, to reproduce all the earlier work and see all, all the transient uh, Epiradical species. What do you What do you figure the total cost of that research was, Tony? Not excluding the the T the R A or whatever. But what do you figure that he put into that whole project of yours? All the money must have been spent on the isotopes. We talking five thousand dollars at the main? Possibly. Did you, remember, ever, did you ever check the citation uh, in, uh, index? Yeah, I did. That? I did. How uh, many How many citations does that work have? Oh, 40 or something like that. It was a large number. No, I bet you it's a lot more than 40. 
Well, at the time, I, I, I took it as a demo at, at one of the ACS I meetings. I bet you if you look up the citation were, index on Tony's work and those, yeah. on those 50 papers, I'll bet you that that is close to a couple hundred. Yeah. Maybe, but it was kind of yeah. thing where... And this was done for 4000 yeah. 5000 bucks. Yeah. I mean, there's, the, the isotopes were the most expensive yeah. rock yeah. because we had uh, the completely due to it and we had yeah. uh, Partially deuterated. Partially deuterated in both uh, ethylene and propylene. And the propylene ones, I think, were more expensive. Sure, centrally yeah, the located. There is an yeah, paper for, uh, on zinc oxide that doesn't cite that work. Okay. Didn't ask what, well, I, I didn't describe why I'll get started, with, started working with Dick. Maybe I should do that briefly. It has to do with cigar, I guess. Probably it was the worst part of it. And that was, he was teaching freshman chemistry and he had all the chemical engineers and chemists in on Saturday morning if you wanted to come in and go over the homework. Actually, about 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we could smoke in class at that time and Dick used to smoke a cigar every now and then. Or, and I remember one day, and it was a day, it was a hot day, and I was sitting in the back of the class and uh, I had to pull my cigar out, and he's sitting in the back of the bus. And all of a sudden, Dick saw me in the back, and he reached out and he grabbed that out of his pocket and grabbed his cigar. I got a cigar too, and he started smoking his cigar. The next day, I, I read it to him, and I said, "Do you ever have anybody do research in your lab?" He says, "Well, I've been waiting for somebody to ask. Yeah, come on by." And he had me build a GC, which I built in a cigar box. And have to this day, which you, you could throw all those little pieces in the cigar box, and with the with the attenuator out front. I, mean, I still have yeah. the schematic okay. of that GC. Yeah. Yeah. You wasn't the one that I, I, I made. Two <laughs> I, 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 I did the work on. Yeah. I, I yeah, built a GC that? while I was there too. I I had built GCs before, but uh, I upgraded mine a level from the one with the battery. You bought an amplifier. I, I bought a Heathkit power supply. Ah, <laughs> and, uh, that's no good. You used the Heathkit power supply, with mine. but. Uh, I, I had trouble getting my my research started in that I kept finding interesting things, but I'd go and start looking through the literature when I'd find something, and sure enough, about the about the same issue of journal of catalysis, I'd find a reference, and thought, well, I'll scratch that. Because I started off, we were going to do, uh, do work with ethylene hydrogenation, and it was probably supposed to be something of a follow-up yeah. on Tony's work, except that I was going to work with chromium oxide rather than zinc oxide, and chromium oxide is is more active, and I, I built a GC to do the work, and uh, gas uh, back in line to, to work in. I did some preliminary experiments with the GC and got got that working after it was built. And uh, I thought, well, we'll do some work with the infrared. That was supposed to be the next be part of right. it too. And I had just learned to blow glass. And I had built this uh, this cell, and I took it over and put it in the departmental instrument. And I was a little nervous in, in tightening it up, and I saw this thing go and smash. All right, and it, it just rotated in the clamp. It wasn't uh, wasn't wasn't tight enough, so I had to go back and, and, and blow more glass and uh, put this thing back together again. So it probably took me two weeks to get that experiment started, and I I uh, had a sample pretreated. I introduced uh, some ethylene first. Okay, I was going to put the ethylene on the surface and then and then dose in uh, hydrogen. And I took a look at it in the infrared, and I got these two uh, gigantic peaks of the CH stretching region. And I took another look at it, and they were getting bigger, and they were getting bigger. And uh, these things, these things grew for about three days. Okay, and I, I figured out in the course of those three days that what we were doing is we were polymerizing ethylene. And, uh, and I thought uh, that that looks like. A, like a good project, we can switch from hydrogenation to polymerization uh, easily enough. And rushed off and uh, took a look at the literature. And there, in the last issue of Journal of Catalysis, was a, a paper on the infrared spectra of polymerizing oh. ethylene on chromium <laughs> catalysts. <laughs> but it, it seems like we went through about three iterations before we finally got something that worked. We built. What are you going to say, Tony? Come on. I, I was going to describe the cells <laughs> that, that we built. We, we built. we usually had just the Pyrex cells, and then we start building quartz cells to go to higher and higher temperature. And then we, we built a metal cell to go to low temperatures. 
That metal cell was rather interesting because it had a compartment to hold the liquid nitrogen to actually keep it in place. And that was I still got it. Okay, that's it. I, I rebuilt all those cells myself when I started, especially the the uh, short path length cells. In fact, I took one from Carnegie Mellon to uh, PQ. I mean, I've never used it yeah. there, but yeah, Louis Dixon was involved in yeah. improving those designs because the old designs just had windows uh, epoxied onto the right. end of the tube and with a little bit of copper right. uh, wrapped around around the end, and they used to mix a little bit of copper with the epoxy to give you a little better heat yeah. transfer. That was to keep but, the windows cool so the so, so yeah, windows wouldn't but, fall uh, off. But, but while I was there, Dick got his first NSF grant, okay, that he had been doing everything on PRFs right. uh, up to that point. And it was a gigantic sum of like, <coughs> about 30000 a year, all right? Mm. And uh, so we, we were upgrading at that point, and the machine shop started making uh, sort of we designed the end pieces with yeah. O-rings, and yeah. the machine shop started cutting them. And, uh, that that was definitely an improvement, to and and worked very well, because the only reason the epoxy and the uh, crystals worked for us was that we were use, really using a substandard grade of epoxy, in that you could uh, you could soften it with benzene, so that you you would epoxy your windows on. And then when you were ready to take your sample out, well, then you would you would soak the windows with uh, in benzene, right, right. and uh, it, right. it would, it yes. would separate yes. separate yeah. from the crystals and yeah. separate from the quartz, and you could pop these things off. Well, uh, the stockroom changed uh, the epoxy they were ca carrying, probably because too many other people complained about this lousy epoxy that they had. And uh, but then you could no longer soak them off with benzene, so it, it really became critical that the, that the end designs be improved, and, uh, <laughs> so that you get samples in there. I think I think that the most exciting thing uh, that that happened in the lab when I when I was there was when Ray Renard, when Ray Renard lit the end of the hydrogen tank. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh. and that thing went on it's like a flamethrower. Well, there, there was some guy there when I was there who, who tried to run uh, the, uh, the ammonium dichromate decomposition, yeah. which is ordinarily the green volcano, yeah. and, and he, did, he did it in closed cells, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, he, he broke a couple of hood windows in doing that. For, fortunately, he used to start his experiment and then he'd leave, okay? Then he'd go up, he went up for beer, or he would get hungry and he'd go out for a sandwich. Well, he didn't drink beer, but he'd go, get hungry and go out for a sandwich. Or, uh, have to walk the dog or something like that, and uh, <laughs> otherwise somebody could have been hurt had he uh, had he been around when the thing blew. <laughs>